la revolución industrial en sus consecuencias ante et es un desastre por la raza humana. Bonjour, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to talk about Mark Ogier, or as I'm going to pronounce in the English way, Mark Ogier. He's also known as Saint Loop. We will come back to that a little later. Mark, as of late, have actually started to pop up more and more. People start using him for their little mods in Hearts of Iron 4. But the thing is, who is he? Now, there is a lot of information out there, but there's a lot in French. Now, you see, the English sources for this is very lackluster. And, and in many ways, he has never really been in the English Anglosphere of any importance up until more or less now. So I thought, all right, why not introduce him a little bit more to the Anglosphere and tell them what he is, what he believed in, what influenced him, what he'd done, and a little bit like that. So now then, who was Mark? Well, Mark is born in 19th of March, 1908, and died 16th of December, 1990. Mark started his journey, actually, from a socialist perspective. And early on, I'm guessing this is more out of a rebellion. He formulates a new socialistic framework the further time goes on, but he started from the basis of socialism. But he did this by living in youth hostels, having a conversation with other socialists, sort of living the, you know, as many do today, the university sort of socialist life. We live in like a, together in a larger group. And from this collective, he started to reform his socialism to be based around the idea of environmentalism, which is going to be one of his main focuses. Uh, which is one of the two main focuses that he more or less writes about. But early on, it was also, in a way, about pacifism. Because he formulated himself after John Gino, which was one of the main uh, environmentalists or primitivists in France during the time. Reading this off the wiki, which is just horribly framed, it says, all the... Oh, no, hold on. Wait. Wow, okay, I gotta stop here. I was about to make a bit of a joke how horrible the English Wikipedia is, but it's a lot worse. A lot worse than I thought. So, the wiki is taking it from one book, as I mentioned before. It's from the 1980s. Let me get the book here. Biographical Dictionary of Extreme Right since 1890. And is reading here. Why would they frame it this way? I'm very confused about the framing of this. Because it's horrid. Although its leader, John Gino, was not a fascist, it was Auger's fascination with Gino's primitivism. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, what? Although its leader? What leader? Leader of this Rentraik de Arbogues, which is the youth hostels. Leader of that? He was not the leader of that. What? Or why did you frame it as John Gino was not a fascist? Like, neither was Mark. No one was a fascist here. So why did you frame it this way? Who wrote this dog shit? This is, okay, this is why you gotta be a little bit careful when it comes to Wikipedias. Yes, use as a good baseline, and I do like using it as a baseline sometimes. It's easy to go in, because I can read, like, when he was born, when he died, without having to look into a book, you know, that's really good. Stuff like that, like the small, de like, those type of details that you can't really get wrong because it's factual. But when it comes to framing, for example, with this, it's like, ugh. Who wrote this garbage? But yes, he was uh, fascinated by John Gino's primitivism. But, ugh, ugh, horrible framing. But the reason why he was fascinated by it is because, in a way, it goes into his socialistic mindset. So John Gino and Mark, early on in his life, were also pacifists. But things changed for both of them. Neither of them kept being pacifist around the events of World War Two and a little bit before that. So for Mark, he actually more and more turned to the right after reading Alphonse de Cator Briand. And he describes some of the horrific brutality of World War One and what can come of pacifism. And to avoid this type of destruction, 
he had to go away from pacifism because sometimes being passive will destroy more than being more active. And this will be very relevant later on when World War II happens, but we'll come to that. The second point that formulated his socialism was an anti-Christian take because he also viewed Christianity as a destruction of the environment because there has no roots in the environment around you while paganism has a root and sort of taking life forces with the environment itself is that paganism views itself as protecting the clay, the land around itself and making itself beautiful and focusing on that while Christians doesn't care so they're decadent. They don't care about the environment around them and a few things like this. So, and the way to understand this as well is in John Gino's most famous book, which is the book, The Man Who Planted Trees. In some sense, a pagan book, which is quite interesting. It wasn't formulated in the idea of Mark, because this book is much, much later, but it sort of goes into the same concepts that Mark also believed in, but obviously didn't have the book. But let's say what the book is about. Two men, one, that's you, the I in the story, walking down some fields, just minding his business, just enjoying himself, trying to go to a well because he's getting thirsty, the well is dried up, but a man comes up and claims there's another well in another location where he lives. And as they go there, he started to notice that there were some trees planted all over the place. And he asked, oh, why is this? And he says, yeah, well, I moved out here after my wife died and I decided to plant a tree every day. And he showed him how you plant a tree. It's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Good for you. So, so like, just living here and minding your business and caring about the land around you. I mean, he's living his good life. He's, he, he's not, des like, uh, sad and he's not that poor. He just enjoys planting trees. And then I, the protagonist, goes to World War One, fighting, boom, 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 doing that, and comes back after World War One, and notice that there were so many saplings. Oh, just an entire field, entire valley, just a massive amount of land with just saplings. It's not the end of World War One yet, so World War One was still happening. Uh, and when the war sort of came to the valley, they decided to keep the place safe was very confused about the area. The government actually thought that this area was some sort of supernatural area because they didn't know about the man living there. So the the man that you met, that I met, is not known. It will never be known throughout history. The only one who met him were you, or the, the, the I character. Protagonist, I should say, she's the right word, the protagonist. And then throughout the time, it starts growing and growing and growing. People don't notice, it's like, oh my God. And people start moving in. And it just becomes what is defined as some sort of a Garden of Eden. It's just so beautiful. And when the protagonist came there the second time, he actually was sort of healed from stress and from problems. He was in peace. It was amazing. The PTSD, the trauma was all gone. It was in peace. And that's why all the people start moving in again, because of the peace. And the thing is, it's simple. The story is simple. It's just care about the land around you. Like, go plant some trees. Go and do that. And the effect of it, even though it's a small thing, has tremendous effect on the, on the world around you. Yes, because you care. And here it goes into the pagan idea. You care for the land. While for Mark, a Christian doesn't care about the land. While the pagans do. And the same thing, just care about the land around you. And it's not because you want to have, like, tap on your shoulder saying you did a good job. No, it's just, it's the land around you, it's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with just having things beautiful. You don't need praise for it. And the man, you know, he died and no one knew about him. And he was just planting trees. So now it comes to World War Two. <sighs> things are different now. And in a way, he knew that the French really didn't have any chance when it came to the Nazis invading France, but he actually had nothing against certain parts of National Socialism. He wanted capitalism gone from society. He didn't believe that was good for nature or for humans. And second, he believed that Adolf Hitler was a way of returning to paganism. 
There's quite a lot of quotes and poems out there written by him during that time about Hitler. But I won't read them. Uh, but they are very spicy, I have to say. But he bought into the rhetoric quite a lot. And But he believed it could help remove the Christian idea away from Europe and bring in a new pagan era. As stated here, the times have come to say that Apollo and Pallas Athene are the images of man and not the Nordic woman, an assertion quite impossible at the time of the Jewish conspiracies. So yeah, he was an anti-Semite as well. During the occupation, Auger led a youth movement for a new Europe, and he became a member of the French Popular Front. And then he became part of something called Legion of French Volunteers Against Bolshevism, or LVF. He was wounded in the fighting and reparated to France. In June of 1943, he edited the LVF newspaper, Les Combattants Européennes. He returned to Germany in 1944 with the French Waffen SS on the Eastern Front as an accredited journalist. And here, I have to say, it doesn't state anywhere, I have one of the books about this. He published one book on the Waffen SS and it's about the grill because they actually worked together a lot with the Belgium SS with Leon de Grill in the Eastern Front. And we're going to do a video on Leon de Grill. We're going to talk about, well, not they themselves. They, no, we can actually talk about them sort of interacting with each other a bit and what the grill's idea of the Eastern Front was. He hated the Eastern Front. It's, it's mud roads, but I'll talk about this in another video. After the war ended, he had to go into hidings, and he began writing a lot more. But he did it under a synonym, where he called himself Saint Loop. He calls himself a little bit more, but Saint Loop is the name he started using. So you're going to see this a lot, this name, when you look him up, Saint Loop. It more or less became who he was, what he wrote, because he wrote a lot of prize-winning books under the name Saint Loop. And really interesting, once he got a reward for one of his books and he had to publicly show up to get the award, and he did, and they sort of figured out who he was. <laughs> so uh, he got punished for it. Under the synonym, he also earned quite a lot of money. Uh, he earned some money to move to Argentina in which he actually enlisted in the Argentine army, attained a rank of lieutenant colonel, and was a sky instructor for the first lady of Argentina. So he was quite high up in the Argentinian society. But he got pardoned and returned to France. To clarify, it was on the verge of obtaining the Gourcant for the night beginning at Cape Horn, when his identity is revealed by Le Figuro Letariere, published several books to order for the French LVF and the French Waffen SS. Another thing, after sort of publishing, beginning a bit older, you know, you don't want to do political activism forever, he became very devoted to motor vehicles. And he wrote a lot of books about Renault and uh, he's somewhat known in the French circle for his <laughs> ideas of motor vehicles, where you can actually find French articles just talking about his interest in cars, which I find very fascinating. To sum up what we've seen, he started as a socialist, got his way into environmentalism and primitivism, got an anti-Christian stance and a pro-pagan stance because of the environmentalism, was a pacifist in his youth, but ended it once learning more about the horrors of pacifism, wanted to help national socialists because he believed that they would end capitalism, and end Christianity. So when it comes to the question, is this guy like a Nazi? Well, no, like he's not per se a Nazi. If he knew the economic stance and a few things, I, I don't think he would do it. But I, I think he saw it as a mean to an end. Like it's better we try that than stay in this system that hurts the environment. Hard to say, hard to say, but he devoted himself quite a lot to the idea and became a bit fanatic towards it. But uh, in the end time, he also wrote quite a lot to different far-right French publications. And he has influenced 
quite a lot of more regional nationalistic and pagan nationalists in France. So for people who are up for splitting, like Brit uh, Brittany should split or a few other regions should split from France, they usually use him as an inspiration because he talks a lot about, you know, splitting up to help the environment, to help the region. Because in a sense it, here as well, like, who cares more about your own region? Well, obviously it's going to be the people living there. And again, as I've said many, many times before in my videos, paganism is locational and genetic based. So one can believe that if you are connected to the land, more spiritually or genetically, that you will care more for the land. That's exactly what Mark would have thought. So I hope I have brought some sort of understanding. It's muddled because the information out there isn't too great on the English front. There is a few, but it just rambles, I think. And the French has some good. I'm going to put something in the description of the text I had that I translated from French and do my best with that. Otherwise, if there's any more questions, um, please ask. And I beg of you, rewrite this fucking Wikipedia article. It's dog shit. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much.